everybody and welcome to my weekly wrap-up of March 6th, 2016, wherein I tell you about all the things I read this past week. You may have noticed that I didn't do one of these last weekend, and that's because I filmed separate review videos for all three books that I read that week, so I decided I wasn't going to, but those videos will be up in the very near future. This past week I read three novels, a comic, and I reread a novella. First, The Winged Histories by Sophia Samatar. This is the sequel to A Stranger in Alondria, which came out in 2014. I loved A Stranger in Alondria. I love the writing. I love the story. I just, I love the world. It was beautiful and so well done. It was a, it was a five star book. And this is not like a direct sequel, but it takes place in the same world and it involves the historical event, this rebellion that happens in the background of Javik's journey in A Stranger in Alondria. The Winged Histories is told in four separate narratives from four women who are connected to each other and whose lives are caught up in this rebellion. The first one is Tavis. She becomes a soldier and along with her cousin Dacia, she leads the rebellion of Castenia against Alondria. Then there is Siski, her sister, who is in love with, was in love with, and was supposed to marry their cousin Dacia. There is a woman named Saren, who is Tavis's lover and a singer and musician. And then there is Tialon, who is the daughter of the Priest of the Stone, and the Cult of the Stone is part of the rebellion. People are trying to fight against it. Tialon and Siski's stories were my favorites. They're the second and fourth, I think, in this. In this. Um, and Siski's in particular because it's the, the capstone of the story when everything comes to a head and all these things that are hints that are dropped in the story start to bear fruit at the end. The tabs in here, for example, are I basically got to Siski's story and I suddenly realized that there are all these references to the Dravetti and I was like, oh, I'm gonna go back and see these symbolic references to what was going on. That was really cool. This is about women realizing, I think, how central they are to history, wanting to make a mark, not wanting to be forgotten, but also wanting to live their lives. They all have to make decisions in this book that feel like they aren't incredibly momentous decisions, and yet by the end you realize that they are. And I think in a way that when when anybody becomes an adult, you might have that moment where you realize that you have just done something that is going to affect other people, that you are not a child anymore. What you do in this world matters. And I think that all of these characters have kind of moments like that, or you can see yourself that they have moments like that, where they cease to be a child and they are now an adult. And there are a lot of flashbacks to these women's childhoods, which I also thought was really interesting. Like, all of this was set in motion when they were young, and they are just now beginning to realize that there was a lot more going on in their childhoods and with their families than they knew when they were kids. I don't think this is a book to just read on its own. I think that it's a much more enjoyable and rich reading experience if you've read A Stranger in a Laundria first. Not necessarily because you need to know everything that happened in A Stranger in a Laundria, you don't, but I think that the accumulation of the world building and knowing what the world is like just helps with this story a lot more. I particularly feel like the narrative of A Stranger in Alondria was smoother and more straightforward and was just easier to get into that story. And this one was a bit disjointed. It is four distinctly separate narratives. It has four parts. In this one, I really had parts that I liked and I really had parts that I did not understand exactly what was going on or why it was being told in that way. And I did not have that problem with A Stranger on a Laundria. So I enjoyed it overall and I thought it was very beautifully written and I think the characters are sticking with me a lot longer than I thought they would. There's just something very haunting to me about Tavis and Tialon, I hope I got her name right, and about Siski. So if you've read A Stranger in a Laundria and you really enjoyed it, then I would definitely say pick up The Winged Histories, but keep in mind it is a very different book. It is just different in every single way and just because you love A Stranger in Alondria, I wouldn't say that you would necessarily love this. Then I finished Flowers for Algernon by Daniel Keyes, which is a very famous speculative fiction science fiction story about a mentally disabled man named Charlie who is given an operation that turns him into a super genius, but then he slowly slides back into being mentally disabled and less intelligent. Maybe my expectations were too high, but I felt it slightly underwhelming, like I expected it to hit me harder, and maybe 
mainly it just made me really furious about how mentally disabled people are treated horribly by people who are supposed to love and care for them, like their family and their friends, and then they're taken advantage of by everybody. I was just so angry about how Charlie was treated by people, especially because it's it's painful enough to read that kind of story, but this is also from Charlie's perspective. The story is what he has written in his own progress report, so you get to see how his intelligence improves. You get to see him understanding for the first time what his memories actually mean, that he suddenly comprehends that his friends aren't really his friends, that those things that they have done that he thought meant they were friends actually means that they were making fun of him. And him realizing that and realizing also how his family has kind of abandoned him and then knowing that he is going to slide right back into that kind of life and he can do nothing about it. That hurts. There's a point in the story where Charlie says to one of the men who has done this to him, uh, this scientist is, is like claiming that he's made Charlie a person, and Charlie tells him, I was a human being before you did this to me. I was a person. You know, mentally disabled people, people who have problems are not less than human. They are people too, and yet so often they are viewed as being not human, not being a real person. And I I loved reading about Charlie realizing that people are thinking of him that way and then fighting back against it, like actually saying something, that he would say that felt like a very strong moment for his character. That's the part that really got to me, but pretty much everything else I was kind of iffy about, especially the bit about Charlie investigating like sexual relationships and romance for the first time. Like I can understand why that was part of the story, but I was really uncomfortable with his relationship with um, Miss Kenyon. By today's standards and like scientific experiments and stuff, this whole thing is incredibly suspect, but that bit about him getting involved with Miss Kenyon really pushed my boundaries of what I thought was probably ethically acceptable in this situation. And I, I felt really bad for both of them though because I could understand why in both cases they were involved with each other. It was pretty difficult though. I ended up rating this one 4 out of 5 stars for whatever star ratings are worth these days, and I would recommend it to people who want to read classics in the field. Next I read The Traitor Bar of Cormorant by Seth Dickinson, which is another book that wants to punch you in the gut and make you feel things. The story follows the woman of the title, Bar of Cormorant. Her land is conquered by the Empire of Masks, the Masquerade. Her parents, her fathers, and her mother are badly hurt by the Empire, and her whole way of life has been destroyed destroyed basically, but she is kind of a savant. The masquerade takes her in and trains her to be the perfect masquerade citizen, and then they send her off to another kingdom that they have conquered to suppress a growing revolution. Baru, of course, is secretly planning to subvert the Empire from within, to become her enemy, to know her enemy, and to bring them down, all so that she can save her homeland. But man, she really gets in over her head. At a certain point, every single thing that Baro does in this book, you're like, oh my god, that is not going to work out the way that you think it is. You were making too many sacrifices. You were compromising yourself so much that nothing of you is ever going to survive this. There's only so far you can go before you have truly become the thing that you hate and despise, and it just doesn't matter anymore. Like. It's a, it's a question of how many wrongs make a right. Well, no wrongs make a right, I'm sorry. I really enjoyed the story though. I think some people think that the middle of the story kind of dragged because it was a lot of just talking about how things were going to work. I never at any point felt like the story was dragging because I just really enjoy stories like this. It was very political, it was very much about how a rebellion or a re revolution can be run with money, about the accounting and economic side of things because Borrow is for most of the story, an accountant for the Empire, and I really liked seeing 
war and revolution from that standpoint. I think Baro is very close to being, or probably for many people, an unlikable narrator, and not exactly a reliable one either, and that just makes the story have more layers. There were a lot of other things that I enjoyed about the story as well, including how multicultural and diverse it was. I thought that it incorporated both multiple ethnicities and sexual orientations and cultural differences to really highlight what was going on in the story and how the characters were motivated and what they wanted. It just, it really worked and it felt like a real world. And I, at first when I heard that this was probably gonna be a series, I thought, really, why? But now, I want to know a lot more. And I should conclude by saying that I do understand why this is not the right novel for many people. I understand why people give this low ratings because you just might not like it. I just happen to really like it. The last thing that I finished was The Sandman Overture by Neil Gaiman with art by J.H. Williams III and Dave Stewart. This is beautiful and it's got an okay story, I guess. I was quite happy to find out that this is sort of a prequel story. It's that thing that Dream has done that's referenced at the beginning of Sandman and you never find out what it was. This is that story. One of the versions of Dream is killed and then our version of Dream goes off to find out why. And then essentially I think it's a story about Dream tying up loose ends from a mistake that he made a long time ago. This is the hardcover deluxe edition and it's got a beautiful cover, but it also has artwork underneath the dust jacket. Like that. I love how vibrant and colorful this is. Um, it's definitely using all the colors of the rainbow. Um, and there are also a couple of places where there, I think it's a double gate fold or something where you have these huge spreads. There are two of these. I thought that was really cool. As a piece of art, I think this is amazing. I could just spend a lot of time staring at the artwork, which I think is intentional, and it really makes me want to go back and reread Sandman now, not just for the story, but also to admire the artwork, because when I first read Sandman when I was a teenager, I think I started reading it when I was 14 or 15, I never read graphic novels or comics or anything like that before, and I don't think I really understood how the artwork worked, especially why illustrators changed from issue to issue. It really threw me off and I really want to go back now and check that out again. Oh, and the other thing that I read, I reread Binti by Nettie Okorafor, which is a novella. It's been nominated for the BookTube SFF Awards and I said I would reread it and I did. I'm not going to talk about it, however, because I still have a review of this, which I'm very proud of, so I will link that for you. I am currently reading The Snow Queen by Joan D. Vinge and I'm more than halfway through this, so I hope to finish this, probably not today, but very, very soon. And on Monday, I'm going to be starting a buddy read for Pandora's Star by Peter F. Hamilton with a bunch of people. That is everything that I read this past week, and that's what I'm currently reading. And I don't have much more to say than that. I hope you guys had a great weekend. I hope you got lots of reading in, and I will talk to you again soon. Bye.